really excited to do this session today uh, on innovations in finance and how they can accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, we had, I think at last count, 120 uh, RSVPs for this session. Uh, and at some point soon, we'll figure out uh, how many people are actually on. Um, I'm Sunil Paul. I'm co-founder uh, and CEO of Spring Free EV. Um, we're going to talk about that, but most of that conversation is going to happen um, through others on this on this panel. We'll introduce in just a second. Um, first, a quick uh, round of 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 kind of housekeeping. So. Uh, we have a dedicated Q&A button you'll see at the bottom of your screen on the right. Uh, if you've got a question, uh, you can put it in the Q&A and we'll answer it. We'll, we're first going to do a little bit of a uh, uh, back and forth kind of fireside chat kind of thing. We don't have a fire, sorry, but um, we'll have a little bit of an exchange and then there'll be an opportunity for Q&A, which is always my favorite. Um, it'd also be great if you can go ahead and start in the chat. I'm gonna open up chat so I can see it myself. Um, ah, I see that we've got 32 people, uh, 41 I see now, are, are in the audience. So uh, one thing to do is just to get a sense of who's out there, uh, if you can go ahead and go into the chat, uh, and click the chat button, and little panels show up for those of you who have been in a cave and not been on Zoom for the last 18 months. Um, and put in your name, put in your location, and then put in a secret skill. Secret skill, someone, something that no one else knows. So I'll, I'll just tell you what mine are. You already know who I am. I'm here in San Francisco. Uh, my secret skill is... And, and literally only my wife, my kids, and, and my co-panelists here uh, know this until now. Uh, my secret skill is that I have been learning how to flint nap, make stone tools. So do, that, do with that what you will. Um, well, let's get going. Um, the goal today is to, to, to really dig into two very interesting uh, ideas around mobility and finance. Um, we're going to hear from two very accomplished people who have a lot of depth in finance and capital markets um, and explore a new idea around uh, uh, a mileage purchase agreement and ideas, some of which are new, around blockchain and, and mobility. Um, so let me first introduce uh, Cassandra John. Um, Cassandra is... Uh, CFO, CFO and co-founder of Spring Free EV. Um, before that, and when I first encountered her uh, about a year ago is when we met, um, she was advising companies on using innovative climate financing solutions uh, to help them figure out how to scale. Uh, and before that, she was a Wall Street executive uh, focused on uh, deploying financial infrastructure. So welcome, Cassandra. Casey, as, as I, I have called you, um, and I think lots of people call you. Um, so just a quick question for you, Casey. Um, your LinkedIn profile, I noticed, says creatively using capital to solve for climate. Um, we, share the, we share this kind of passion around climate. Uh, I'm really curious, like what got you interested in, in capital? So I, I think it's a, a really, um, I started in engineering school, but I ended up not staying. Uh, I was much better at um, financial numbers, which are a little bit more flexible. Um, but I like to describe it as you drive over a bridge and most people go in a car and you see a bridge and it's a bridge. Uh, I drive over a bridge and I think to myself, finance helped build that. Um, so I have this perspective of finance as it enabling the infrastructure and the world around us. And I ended up in energy, in climate by saying, I have all these skills, these great fun skills, useful things that I learned in finance. How can I help enable the future that I wanna live in? So that's how I ended up in, in climate. Wow, that's amazing. You totally belong in the world of capital. When I'm driving over a bridge, I'm like, 
what if this disappeared? <laughs> I don't think that very often. It's okay. Um, in case everyone's worried that I've got some bridge paranoia, it's only minor and one of this just watch out. out for the old ones with lots of ice. You could be right. Just yeah, just just a warning. Right. <laughs> and the ones that definitely are desperate desperate need of financing. Um, okay, well, let me introduce now Chris uh, Ballinger. Um, Chris is executive director of, of Moby. Um, Moby is you you might associate it with music, but it stands for the Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative. Um, before that, and where I met him, uh, he had a long career at Toyota. Um, he held a number of executive positions there, including uh, CFO and head of strategy at Toyota Financial Services. Uh, and he also ran the blockchain initiative uh, while he was at Toyota uh, Research Initiative. Uh, and uh, before Toyota, he uh, spent some time in the White House uh, on the Council of Economic Advisors. So welcome, Chris. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I, you know, you also have this very deep background and experience in capital. How, how did you get interested in capital and finance? Uh, back when I was just starting out, um, I decided I wanted to go into the private sector. The most interesting thing in the private sector was derivatives. Uh, at that time, only two derivatives had been executed. Uh, one was by the World Bank and one was by Bank of America. Uh, uh, it was very hard to get hired by the World Bank if you were a, a US citizen. So that left Bank of America. Uh, I went into capital markets at Bank of America and uh, uh, was involved in the starting of their derivatives practice and writing some of their original uh, option software and eventually risk management and eventually uh, got into treasury. And that's how it sort of led me to CFO. Uh, but it, it turned out to be a really good background for things blockchain. Right, that makes a lot of sense. So you were, you initial interest in derivatives you're right that's there's so much uh in the blockchain world that is straight out of that that's derivative of the derivative world i, I think i was I, I i was involved in one of the first auto securitizations uh in the in the mid 80s and uh, i i mentioned that because uh, uh another attendee on the call howard uh Altarescu, uh securitization lawyer extraordinaire uh, claims to have uh, been involved in the first one. And so we always fight over that as who was really first. He's, he's on the, he's, he's one of the attendees. Excellent. And he was also, he was also uh, the co-chair of our uh, securitization and smart contract, finance securitization and smart contract working group for, for Moby. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, welcome Howard out in the audience there. Um, so let's, let's dig into um, some of these ideas that, that both of you are uh, kind of uh, working on. Um, Casey, you have, have co-founded this company, Spring Free EV, to go pursue uh, a new idea around uh, electric vehicle finance. Um, tell us a little about that story of, first, well, first of all, what is it and how did you get involved? Why are you involved in this particular project? So the, the, the product that we're innovating around um, is something that Sunil, you know, that you helped uh, bring to light, which is the mileage purchase agreement. And I think the best way to, to describe it is that um, you, we, we use our cars on a, a per mile basis. Everyone's paying attention to their odometer. Um, when you go to get a lease, they say, don't drive too many miles. Um, part of the benefits of getting a loan is that you can drive as many as you want. You can do whatever you like with your car. Uh, and as someone who grew up wanting a drag race, um, possible secret skill, uh, I, you know, you, when you own a car, you can modify it as you need to. Um, but a mileage purchase agreement says, how about you finance by how you use your vehicle on a per mile basis? And we have a lot of people in this country who look at their vehicles as a path to accessing their job, um, moving their family around. So it's, a, it's really critical to, to, for them to being able to live their lives. And they actually do pay attention to how much they spend on a per mile basis. So why can't I finance on a per mile basis? So we're actually generating a financial product that is meeting our customers at how they really live their lives. Um, and then the, the second piece of this, and, and yeah. you tell me if I'm going too deep into it, um, is that when you look before, at the tip Before you go into the details of how it works, okay. tell us why are you working on this project? What drew you into it? Um, 
So coming back to the idea of how can we use finance to actually enable the world that we want to live in, um, emissions from transportation is one of the largest areas of actually producing emissions that we're trying to stop. So if we're able to create a financial product that allows more people to access EVs and to use them, we're actually allowing everyday people just by living their lives um, to significantly and positively impact climate change. So for me personally, being able to help commercialize on that product to innovate and develop that product and bring it to market allows me to personally enable everyone around me um, to, to help mitigate climate change. So that's why I'm here. Excellent. Okay, so how does it work? Tell us about this, this MPA thing. Um, so uh, there's two ways to look at a car. Um, it, it's an asset and, and a loan and a lease just assumes that this is how much it costs and this is how much I finance. And based on my credit, um, I get a better or worse rate. Um, we're creating a product which says, um, there's a part of that that it is based on credit. Um, hopefully we, we pay our bills as best as we can. But the other portion of it, which says, hey, I need to drive this many miles a month. You should just pay as much as you need to use. And maybe the next month you need to drive a lot more. Um, we're creating a product that allows people to, to make that choice. So to be able to control how much they spend that matches their needs. Um, in addition to that allows an electric vehicle, which we know right now costs more, um, but allows us to bring down the usable costs based on how you use it. So the product works in a small fee that you pay, just, just to access it, and then the amount that you pay based on your actual uses. So kind of flipping the model from buying the asset to access to the service that it provides. Exactly. And, uh, and there's a particular focus on electric vehicles and why electric vehicles versus others. Um, so electric vehicles, we know right now are more expensive. Over time, um, that will eventually come down. And there's all there's so many other companies doing a lot of work to reduce the cost of batteries, um, to reduce the cost in manufacturing. But people need to be able to use those vehicles right now. Climate change is, is an immediate, current, present danger, um, not to like sort of steal a, a Hollywood term, but it's real, it's here. Um, so if we can do something, uh, that allows people to benefit from the fact that over time it will cost less. These vehicles will last longer because there's less maintenance. Um, and in terms of cost for, for gas itself, electricity um, is cheaper as well. We're, this is why we have to do it now. And this is why we're focusing on electric vehicles because that's the, that's the impact. Um, that's the path to the positive impact and the reduction of emissions. Okay. Um Let's turn now to, that's, that's super interesting. I mean, I'm obviously very interested in the topic, but I'm trying to, to not <laughs> go too deep on that because I want to hear a little bit about blockchain and Mobi. Um, so Chris, tell us, tell us first of all, what, what is Mobi? What's it about? And, and yeah, just to, what's it all about? All right, so, so some brief background. Mobi is a a global nonprofit consortium. We have about 100 members, including uh, some, some big governments, some big NGOs, some really big companies, and uh, lots of uh, startups, uh, including Spring Free as, as well. Uh, the idea is to use blockchain and related technologies. And there's a lot of, of, of things that I would include uh, in, that, in a related like crypto, certain areas of cryptography and private keys and smart contracts uh, to make mobility uh, greener safer and, uh, and fairer. Um, uh, we are working through our members or with our members. We have a number of working groups. Uh, we have been working for about three years now, uh, still growing. Uh, we're moving into an implementation phase uh, that includes some work on, uh, on batteries, battery passports, battery identities, uh, uh, carbon content of batteries, uh, where batteries are charged as a calculation of how green they are as well as vehicle IDs and uh, incentives for greener behavior. So that's a, 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 a So there's a, a lot nutshell. of different, a lot of different things that you're pursuing through the, the Mobi initiative. Uh, what is it that, is there a particular kind of focus area or killer app? And I, I suppose in particular, well, let me ask you first, just the basic question. What do you think is kind of like the thing that is most likely to, to work and, and break out in this, in the category that you're working on. But then I'm also interested in like the intersection with electric vehicle financing yeah. and the opportunity to have an impact yeah. on climate. 
Yeah. So, you know, everybody talks about decentralized finance and, and blockchain payments and tokens, uh, you know, and that gets an awful lot of hype. Uh, I actually think the, the much more interesting and, and, and impactful use case is IoT. Uh, and it, it, in some ways, it's kind of more subtle and, and less dramatic, uh, but it's basically creating identities for things and giving them the ability to transact uh, autonomously. And that would include vehicles, batteries, charging stations. Um, it, and it really gets back to what uh, uh, Casey was talking about with this pay-per-use ecosystem. Uh, people want to consume things uh, as, as services, uh, not, they don't want to be asset owners. Uh, they don't want to pay, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 for something that, uh, that, that, that sits in their driveway, you know, 95% of the time. Uh, and even when it's driving around has all this excess capacity with seats in a trunk. Uh, and that was your original motivation back in, in sidecar, I think for, you know, saying, no, this can be, be done better. Um, but I think that, that, uh, a lot of technologies are maturing to the point. Uh, that this pay-per-use mobility is becoming possible. Uh, a vast majority of new cars are, are connected now. Uh, that you can put in uh, uh, wallets and identities uh, in, in, in vehicles. Uh, you can do the same in infrastructure. You can have uh, uh, ad hoc communications between infrastructure. And so with, you're, with, basically, yeah, yeah. it sounds Go like ahead. Moby builds out this infrastructure that enables all kinds of things, but in particular, this transition to services and it occurs to me that one of the, there's so much more interaction happening with the electric vehicle, with other entities, with charging infrastructure, with, I mean, the batteries in the vehicle itself, with the cloud and communication there, but also opportunities to connect for, for V2G, a vehicle to grid, like having your vehicle be a backup to the grid or to your own house, having the vehicle be uh, connected up to, um, uh, to have kind of demand response so that when there's high yeah. demands, you, yeah. you don't charge the vehicle. All these things require interaction. I think what you're trying to say is there's a, a lot of infrastructure that's required in order to make that happen. There's a lot of infrastructure and there's a lot of standards, right? Before, uh, it, it really depends not on the technology, but on the community, on the, on the scale of adoption. Uh, it's a real chicken and egg problem. And so we're trying to address that with standards around uh, a blockchain. And in particular, uh, with EVs, we had an, uh, an EV uh, to grid integration working group that looked at uh, how do you create two-way integration uh, with these decentralized resources uh, that are vehicle batteries and charging stations and, and more generally, uh, you know, uh, small-scale wind and, and solar. Uh, and, and so we have some standards around that and, and uh, we're moving forward with building a, a, a network so the, the, the uh, software infrastructure and the network infrastructure for our members to come together using the standards to build their own applications. Uh, but in, in, in addition to the work that we've done, what we found is that uh, an awful lot of other smart people are looking at this too, this issue of decentralized energy resources and how you communicate two ways to the grid. How do you protect the grid uh, in, a, in a world where the, uh, the actors, the agents, are not necessarily known, they're, they're edge, they're small scale. You have to give them identities. You have to protect it with cryptography. Uh, you have to create incentives for certain types of transactions and information flow. So I'll just mention two of them. Uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, is no longer about nuclear physics, no longer all about nuclear physics. Some of their really interesting work is about uh, is grid, grid integration of decentralized energy resources. So we actually had their chief data officer speak a couple of weeks ago in a Moby lecture uh, Joe, maybe you can put the, the link to that in, in, in the chat because I think it's interesting and it, and it applies just as much to uh, vehicles roaming around as to uh, small scale decentralized energy resources and grid integration. Um, so that, that would be, be uh, one specific example of it. Got it. You know, uh, you mentioned the, the connection when we met uh, uh, Sidecar era and I was running Sidecar. Um, it was the first ride sharing company. And I have to just mention that one of the important realizations that I've had over the last um, decade is that the the sort of the way I put it is you know the gig economy can't deliver a gigaton of carbon reduction, and it is a learning that uh, my focus on efficiency, creating the first ride sharing company, I incubated uh, Get Around, one of the first peer-to-peer uh, -peer car sharing companies. Um, was 
designed to improve the efficiency of the vehicle, you know, get to that other 95%. And instead of reducing the demand for uh, transportation, uh, we, we encountered the, the rebound effect or Jevons paradox where that increased efficiency increased the demand for the service, not only in ride sharing, but it also changed behavior. People have moved into neighborhoods like the Mission that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Uh, and that innovation has been picked up by others, by the DoorDashes of the world and Amazons and other to, to deliver uh, goods instantaneously or the same day. Uh, and so I have basically, I feel like I, I feel like efficiency just doesn't work as a, as a climate solution uh, because of this significant rebound problem. And, uh, and instead, we really need to be focusing on deploying renewables, re deploying battery, battery powered vehicles um, in order to, to actually have an impact on climate. Um, let's turn to the climate question. Um, so, and I don't know how much it, it enters into uh, Moby's work, Chris, but I know that it enters a lot into our work at Spring for EV. Um, Casey, uh, just to help everyone understand how climate frames the way that we think about things. Um, climate is, isn't just the frame, it is the number one driver for how we think about what we're trying to do here. Um, and, and this is related to your question. We said, why EVs? Because EVs. Uh, and, and the other piece, and, and this is um, something that came from a call I had earlier today. Uh, someone said, how can you track your impact? Uh, and, and I said, well, that's easy. We can, we can confirm that we've driven, our fleet has driven 144,000 emission freeze miles since we've started putting cars on the road. So one of the things is, we want to be able to achieve the scale that we like. We, we want more EVs on the road, we want more drivers, and we want everyone to drive as many miles as you need to, to be able to do, to enable the things that you need to do around you uh, and not worry about um, is your driving having a negative impact because it actually is having a positive impact. So we're able to track and part of the, the metrics that we will measure ourselves against are how many emission free miles that we've caused to put out there. And then uh, I will leave the exact calculation. There's a reason I left engineering school. So I'm gonna leave the calculation of how much reduction to, um, to, to people that specialize in that. And I think Sunil, you had a, you had a, a, a napkin estimate. Yes, I, so for context, um, I did a back of the envelope calculation. I just like to say my back of the envelope if I don't say so myself, is pretty good. I helped this study uh, almost 12 years ago uh, called Gigaton Throwdown, where we looked at how do you scale up different pathways to have an impact on climate. Um, and interestingly, one of the conclusions was EVs could not have a gigaton impact within 10 years, 10 years ago, which has turned out to be correct, but different forms of efficiency could, which led me to car sharing and ride sharing. Um, now, I did, a, I did a spreadsheet calculation, which is out there. If you look on my, uh, look at, look on my blog uh, or on LinkedIn, you'll see a link to can MPAs uh, affect the climate or save the climate. And I, I linked to a spreadsheet that uh, our estimate is that if we can get to 100 million electric vehicles installed, electric vehicles um, by, in the next 10 years, 100 million vehicles will get to one gigaton of emission reduction. Um, now that's, there's always a bunch of assumptions that go into these things, but whether it's 100 million or it's 150 million or 75 million, it's a big number. I mean, that is a big, big number. Um, and we feel that it's possible that it, will, it won't be trivial, but, uh, it is possible for financial innovations like this to scale. We've seen it in solar. One of the key enablers of the tremendous growth and gigaton impact that we've seen with solar is because of third-party finance, power purchase agreements, loans, and leases. Um, so we think we can do it here too. Uh, so things things can only scale if, if the incentives are correct. And uh, so maybe I, sh I should mention 
uh, so getting back to secret skills, that the secret skill of blockchain is incentives. Uh, you know, in, in if, you, if things have identities, if they can participate in an economy, uh, they can pay as you go uh, for mobility, for roads, uh, for their electricity. Uh, and you can attach incentives to that. You can have marginal cost pricing for it that includes social cost for use of the public good, not only the road, the charging, but also for the carbon emission, for example. So you can build that in uh, and create the right incentives for people's behavior to change the micro level, which produces macro changes. So I think that that's uh, uh, one particularly important aspect of what blockchain brings to the table. The other thing I'd mention is uh, when you scale, how you scale matters a lot. Uh, not all EVs are the same, not all batteries the same. Some are produced in carbon intensive ways and some less so. This is why uh, groups like the EU are looking at a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, basically a, a border tax that taxes carbon content uh, to, in order to create incentives for, for lower carbon content. Uh, where you charge matters. Uh, some charging stations are fired by coal plants, some by cleaner, uh, sources like, like hydroelectric. Uh, so you need to track uh, really cradle to grave from the, the manufacture of the battery uh, through how it's used, uh, through its, uh, its second and third use and, and, and recycling. And, and those are things that, that we're working hard on with our members in Moby. Hmm, interesting. Well, uh, I want to open it up for questions. Uh, we've already had a number that have come through. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, uh, we have a Q&A button that is, uh, that's all the way to the right. We've got a number of questions in there. Um, let me turn to one of them. One of them is, um, Casey, how is, the, um, how is the miles purchase agreement different than just a regular automobile lease? Um, I, I think the easiest, uh, the, the easiest difference is uh, an auto lease says, here's the maximum amount of miles we, you drive. And our MPA says, here's the minimum amount that you, you're, you're committing to drive. Um, and that's because we're fundamentally um, concerned about the, the large scale impact uh, of having emission free miles, whereas a lease is primarily <laughs> concerned about retaining an asset value piece. So that's, um, that's kind of one of the first core differences there. Um. There's a, and so, um, and sorry, I was reading questions, so I didn't quite uh, totally hear your answer, but um, one of the ways I often describe it is a lease kind of penalizes you for doing a lot of miles and an MPA has a minimum number of miles. You have to be able to do a certain number of miles to, to get into a, a mileage purchase agreement. Um, um, there's a question here for Chris, uh, why blockchain? Um, like why, why is blockchain necessary in order to be able to create identities after all their OEMs have connected car features, et cetera? Uh, because uh, the next iteration of the web um, is one that will be built um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more decentralized way than the, the web, web, web 3.0 uh, than, than web 2.0. The, the web 2.0 can be characterized as sort of central authorities scraping information, uh, gaining an enormous amount of market power from that. Um, and and uh, if you want to address that, uh, you have to give people more control over their own information, their own content, and a variety of different fields, including in, including uh, you know PII and and and, and location. Uh, having decentralized identifiers, DIDs, uh, is uh, some is an idea that, uh, that really came out of the the Web three consortium, which is uh, uh, Tim Berners Lee's uh, uh, you know a worldwide web consortium. Uh, and we we comply with the decentralized identifier specs of of the uh, of, of that. Um, and what it does is it allows uh, people, companies, things, including vehicles, charging stations, grid, uh, to have identities and to transact with other things in ways that are secure, uh, where the information can't be scraped and and uh, and help to add to somebody's monopoly power. So that's a, there's lots of answers for why you need decentralized identities. Uh, it, that's that's uh, sort of the maybe the, the, the sort of the moral and ethical and what type of world we want to live in aspirational answer. Uh, the technical answers would include um, uh, the world is moving to uh, more towards towards an edge model of computing, 
uh, where there's going to be uh, tens and perhaps hundreds of bands of, of, of edge devices uh, communicating in local ad hoc networks. Uh, there is not time uh, or space to send them for processing to centralized locations. Uh, and if they're going to be processed at the edge, uh, it's a, essentially a decentralized transaction, a decentralized uh, network. Uh, and, uh, and certainly the, the latency for autonomous driving will require that. So technical and sort of ethical reasons why it has to be decentralized identifiers in a decentralized economy. Hence blockchain. Got it, right. Um, there is a question, I guess I should be naming the, the people who ask. Uh, this is a question from Vivek uh, Huthisen. Sorry if I mispronounced the last name. Um, Basically asking um, Casey, but I think this would go to both uh, both of you, is that if the electric vehicle single occupancy um, doesn't that result in a negative uh, climate impact, even if it's replacing a gas powered car? I'm happy to take that in case. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let I'll let you take that one. I I, I have a thought, but I, I want to hear how how you would approach this. Well, it. so the data out there is 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 pretty clear that even if I mean, assuming that you're operating in the United States uh, and not in a hundred percent. Well, actually, I think there's one study I've seen that shows even in a heavily one hundred percent coal electricity generated grid, uh, an EV powered car is still. Uh, more efficient than the gas-powered equivalent car. Certainly, when you look at where EVs are most popular, like California and Texas uh, and, and New York, I mean, these places have very clean grids. Certainly, the U.S. grid is also, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it quite clean yet, but it's cleaner than 100% coal. Um, so, it's, it's a common question, but in fact, um, it's something that, that uh, there's, there's good data out there that shows that it's cleaner than a gas powered car. So, so my answer uh, would be uh, going back to uh, this movement towards the paper use uh, economy and paper use mobility and, um, and, and being able to have uh, decentralized ideas for, for people and things. Uh, you can charge differentially, right? And the, and the, the idea that the secret power of blockchains is incentives. You can charge for how that car is used, including how many occupants it has. Uh, you can give somebody a discount, right? Or a reduction in their road usage charge or their carbon footprint charge uh, based on the number of occupants. We've actually built a, an app to do that. Uh, that's in, in, in beta testing. It's available uh, in, in, in test flight now. Uh, but that's uh, something that uh, our, our members are, are already testing. Interesting. Interesting. I like that secret power of blockchain as incentives. We're going to keep that one. Is, there's so much that you cannot uh, charge marginal cost for today. You know, I, you know carbon emissions being this, yeah. this really obvious one um, and, and road usage being another. Uh, you know, and as a result, uh, cars driving around, around and around the block looking for parking because it's it's essentially costless to use the the, the resource, uh, and so on. Uh, but imagine a world where people had to pay marginal cost for all of the public resources and 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 uh, and air quality and carbon. Uh, the behaviors would be a lot different. It's enormously powerful. Yeah. Also allows for fractional payments in a way that it's harder to do with regular with regular payments. Yeah, Mike. The, so the things that are too expensive to charge for. Yeah. A question from uh, Steve Bloom, who uh, asks, he says he penciled out some numbers for just EVs and figured out that California alone can't do it, which is correct. Uh, and so his question is, what could California do? Um, loan guarantees or, or other things? And he's involved in, in public policy uh, and specifically interested, I think, in public policy angles. Uh, and I would I just broaden the question to what are what are potential public policy um, things that can be done that could help accelerate these innovations? I think one of the strongest public policy things that we've seen are states setting really strong clean energy targets. Uh, I, I can't speak specifically for California since I'm, I'm in New York actually, uh, and I spend quite a bit of time working with New York State on this, but being able to set, here's our targets for emissions. What does that mean uh, in, in terms of 
what that shifts because policy um, sets the market conditions to which you operate in. So as states set these targets or they set these goals, and then they start to implement um, actions, for example, um, New York has done local law 97 in relation to building efficiency, and then now creating a penalty for carbon emissions. So um, they haven't done the equivalent yet in electric vehicles, but we can expect to see more of those. So policy can be setting the market conditions, policy can be setting penalties or costs for not complying, um, it can also be things like loan guarantees and specific uh, programs that can catalyze um, financing, private financing and other um, private market options to be able to meet those um, larger policy goals. So I think California um, has been quite flexible uh, and quite creative in a variety of things. New York has been the same, Vermont and, and a number of states. Uh, and we expect that to catch on across the US um, in ways that support the, the business model that we're putting forward. And also I believe are in aligned with decentralized payments and marginal cost items, we've already seen that in, in a, a less elegant fashion in things like toll costs. Um, you do have carpooling arrangements already that if you have a clean energy vehicle, you have cheaper tolls in certain states. So all of those various incentives coming together and the more that those are easier to implement with things like blockchain, um, it, it creates what I call this um, it, it, it's a it's a tailwind, it's a strong tailwind that is pushing us towards these sort of um, business and financial models. Uh, so now we just have to now now we just have to do all the machinery to make it work. So, um, I, 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 Steve, if you have a, a, a if you have something to do with California uh, policy or California agencies, uh, would love to talk to you. We're talking to a number of state agencies, uh, DOTs. Uh, the the EU Commission is a member of MOBI, and we're talking to them about a number of of pilots and projects involving uh, uh, measuring tailpipe emissions, tracking batteries uh, and incentives. And so happy to talk through some of those initiatives if, you, if you'd like to reach out to us. Um, uh, Joe, maybe you can put our, our, our website uh, address in the, in the, in the chat and uh, our website has a button for getting in touch with us. So there's lots of additional questions. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Steve specifically asks what um, what would the programs be to specific programs to mobilize private capital. Um, maybe we can come back to that uh, later. We are just so everyone can plan. Uh, we're planning on giving everyone a, an opportunity to to sign off and be done in uh, in just five minutes. Uh, if the panelists are willing, we'll stick around for another little bit of time as long as there are additional questions. Um, uh, but we are going to wrap it up in the next five minutes. So um, um, there was a question specifically around how to spread uh, internationally. Uh, Mohammed Yiga, again, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the last name, um, from, from Kampala, Uganda, uh, is asking, how would you be able to spread spread this globally, uh, especially, especially when there's all this uh, increased trade concerns, uh, worries about trade wars, et cetera. Um, either of you want to talk about international? I, I have a comment on it. But Chris, uh, blockchain is kind of almost inherently able to operate across borders, right? Mm, across borders. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll mention a couple of things. Uh, for, first, uh, Mobi is a truly international organization. Roughly a third of our members are Asia, a third are EMEA, and a third are uh, Americas. Um, so uh, we, we, we certainly operate at a, at, a, at a global scale, and the standards and the things that we're doing, uh, we think, apply, and the infrastructure we're building apply globally. Uh, the, the other thing I'd mention is that um, the, the financing can play a, 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 a really important role. Um, if you think about sort of globally, how many people, what percentage of the global 9 billion people on earth can, can buy a, a new electric vehicle? Uh, it's a very small fraction. It's probably less than 5% based on sort of existing financing mechanisms, which generally look at how wealthy you are, what your FICO score or equivalent is uh, if you're not in the U.S., uh, and, and says, oh, are you credit worthy? And then lends to you based on your credit worthiness. Uh, this pay per use notion uh, where you can put the car into service earning uh, in rideshare or delivery 
uh, or in, um, in, in, in other ways, an electric vehicle can be uh, and cheaper in service uh, in, in, in delivering services. Uh, that allows you to, uh, to use the earnings from the vehicle to potentially uh, offset the financing cost. And it means that, that uh, if you have a car that's cheap to operate, cheap to finance, uh, it suddenly becomes the, uh, the, the lowest cost and most efficient way to operate a business. And so that's, that's one thing. Uh, and the reason I mention that in this context of, of only a small percentage of people, uh, it opens up the, the financing to all of those people uh, in the world uh, who can't finance another way because now they can finance based on the revenue stream from the vehicle itself. So uh, I would certainly say that ideas don't have borders. And so from, from our standpoint, the mileage purchase agreement is not something that we want to keep just here for the US or just in a particular state. We want that concept to spread broadly um, in, in ways that uh, credit systems and capital systems are unique to the regions that they're in, but the concept can be then adjusted in that region or that area uh, in a way that allows it to, to just make it broadly accessible. Yeah, I would, I would add, because our top goal is climate impact, it actually creates uh, a desire for this to be spread. And um, you know, we certainly would like to help facilitate that spread by creating a platform that enables uh, uh, entrepreneurs and businesses uh, anywhere to be able to uh, take advantage of an MPA, a mileage purchase agreement kind of kind of uh, instrument. Uh, that's certainly the bigger ambition. Right now, we have a very tight focus on uh, the sort of ride sharing, car sharing uh, world, but uh, we're, we're starting to lay plans for that bigger uh, plan, or the bigger ambition. Uh, there's a question um, from uh, Mark Rose asking, uh, can you talk more about the secret skills of blockchain in terms of incentives and how it can create incentives for the MPA. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to talk about that specifically. I mean, currently the MPA is not being implemented on the blockchain. Obviously we're, we're members of, of Moby and um, looking at ways that it could in the future. But uh, Chris, go ahead. What are your thoughts on how-, how this Yeah, the, 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 the first thing I'd mention is that, uh, you know, the blockchain technology is constantly evolving. Uh, people talk about, you know, sort of putting every little transaction, every bit of data on a chain. Uh, existing public chains can't handle that level of, 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 of transaction and activity today. Uh, we're looking at something that's much more modest and just putting identities on chains and using that as an anchor within trust domains. Um, and what that, what that means is uh, there, there isn't a lot of processing requirement. There's not a lot, a lot of data on chain, uh, but it opens up uh, the, this ability for something to, to have an identity and to transact within an ecosystem. Uh, and that's what, what gives you the ability to pay marginal cost uh, for the things you can measure, tailpipe emissions, right? You can track tailpipe emissions at the level of the vehicle if the vehicle has an identity because you can watch it you can tie its identity to its location, see how it's used, pay for roads, pay for its carbon footprint, give it a discount if it's an EV, give it a discount if it has two or three occupants. All of these things that you would like to do from a social perspective to, to, to uh, incentivize better behavior, you can now do in a paper use economy where you can track these attributes and securely tie them to an identity. So that's it, that's it in a nutshell. So the intersection with an MPA would be once you have the identity, you can attribute mileage and fees and all kinds of things to it. And so MPA could be one of many things that kind of hang off of that identity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so linking identity with, with location. Uh, we've, we've coined the term trusted trip for that. Uh, it fits in very well with this, this idea of, of, of the you know, web 3.0, which uh, is, is also known uh, as the spatial web. Right, the idea that you're tying uh, something's uh, geography and, and physical location and creating digital twins of things. Hmm, interesting. Well, um, it is been, it is uh, 15 till the hour, and uh, to be respectful for everyone's time, um, we we want to wrap. Um, Casey, Chris, are you available to stick around to answer more questions? Um, 
which we will we will do if uh, if people want to stick around. But I want to just wrap and say thank you very much, very much appreciate. I think at peak we had fifty five people in the audience, um, which is a great turnout. We really appreciate the interest in this uh, in this topic. Like we genuinely think uh, that there's opportunities for these innovations in finance uh, and technology to radically transform what's happening with the adoption of electric vehicles and radically transform what's possible with solutions to climate. Uh, please share this news with other people. Please let others know that there is this interesting set of developments happening in the world. Uh, you are under a mandatory disclosure agreement by participating in this, uh, this, this session, an MDA. Thank you all. And um, again, we'll, we'll pause here for a moment. And if anybody wants to stick around for a few minutes, we will answer some of the remaining questions. Otherwise, thank you very much. Have a great day and have a good climate week. Okay, uh, so we have a few minutes left. Let's see if there's uh, some additional questions. Um, uh, I know that there are, uh, there's still 24 people in the audience. So um, let's see. Um, Lou Tucker asks, how do EV trucks stack up against EV cars in terms of reducing carbon emissions? Um, uh, I don't know if somebody else wants to tackle that, but a real, Fast answer to that is EV emissions are a function of a couple of things. The biggest is what might be referred to as the actual kind of the use of the vehicle rather than the production of the vehicle matters for sure. But like for gas powered car, 80% of the emissions of total life cycle emissions are typically from the emissions. So if you can reduce um, that through electricity use, then that helps. Then it comes down to a question of how efficient is the electric vehicle? Um, vehicles like say the Tesla Plaid are not very efficient in the amount of kilowatts that are consumed per mile um, compared to say uh, a lightweight vehicle like the Leaf um, or the, the Bolt. Um, and so they simply are more electricity efficient like just like mileage purchase, I mean, uh, just like MPA, um, <laughs> gosh, MPG, just like uh, MPGs. Uh, miles per gallon, there's a miles per kilowatt hour. Um, and then finally, there's a question of how clean is your grid? Um, unlike gasoline, which is, this falls in a more narrow band. If you are in say Washington state, you have a very, very clean grid. Lou, I happen to know you're in the Bay Area and in San Diego, both of whom have pretty clean grids. Um, if you are in say Indiana, um, where there's still a lot of coal burning, um, your grid's not nearly as clean, and so the, the impact is greater. There are calculators out there that'll help you figure it all out, but um, I guess the short answer is it's, it's complicated. Um, um, someone, Peter Glenn asks, where do we get started for Moby if you wanna build on top of Moby? Um, Chris, what's the easy way to do that? The, 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 there, there is a lot of, uh, of, of standards uh, that are accessible to members. Uh, there's also an awful lot of stuff that's just available to the public on our website. So the place to start is our, our website. Uh, I think there's a connect button or a join button uh, or a get involved button on the main page. Just hit that. Uh, that'll get you into our system and uh, we'll, we can get in touch and, uh, and walk you through where the resources are and, and how you can get involved. Uh, we, are, we are building a, a network uh, for our members that's a, a community uh, infrastructure uh, using our standards um, and, and using our identities. Uh, uh, that would be, uh, uh, if you really want to build and code, uh, that's the, the place to do it. Uh, Caroline's... Sroka, again, sorry about the last name if it's incorrect, uh, asks, how can the MPA or other innovative financial tools be used in a commercial setting and specifically for uh, electrification of fleets for brick and mortar, uh, mortar companies? Um, Casey, you want to take that? I, I, I think it, it fun fundamentally comes down to what we've been talking about today in terms of pay per use. 
uh, fleets have, um, especially if you uh, own a large scale fleet, you are tracking as, as a matter of your accounting, how much you're spending on that fleet in terms of gas, fuel, maintenance, et cetera. Um, electric vehicles, as we already know, have cheaper maintenance um, costs, ideally cheaper fuel costs, depending on the, the state you're in. Uh, so being able to refresh your fleet and buy a new fleet on this model that allows you to absolutely track how much you're using it and to be able to have flexibility in your financing, um, this just becomes another option that fleet um, large scale fleet managers have uh, to electrify their fleets. I might add that if, uh, you know, if you're a fleet manager that is uh, uh, basically small, medium sized fleet managers are a great fit for spring free EV right now. We are also uh, wanting to work with, um, with people who can scale up to larger size fleets. One of the things we know about larger size fleets is that their charging infrastructure is a complicated problem and tends to cause a very long sales cycle. Um, someone I know at, at one of the leading um, charging companies said, the complexity of charging infrastructure goes up exponentially with the number of vehicles involved. Uh, and so we've tended to focus on smaller fleets uh, for that reason. Um, Someone asked another question related to MPA. Oh, right. What are the minimums, uh, minimum miles requirements? Currently for the Spring Tree EV uh, MPA, we're looking for a minimum of 25,000 miles a year. Um, and the minimums vary depending on the type of car, but just to give you a general sense of, of what that is. Um, Brian uh, Grunkmeyer uh, asks, uh, how are we thinking about measuring carbon emission savings from the fleet. Um, uh, I'll answer that and I wonder if Chris has another answer. Um, uh, honestly, Brian, right now we're taking a very rudimentary approach. We measure simply by taking the average, because most of our vehicles are in California, <laughs> we just take the average uh, California uh, carbon emissions and use that against the, the number of miles being, uh, being driven. It's not a very sophisticated measurement. Um, I know you all have uh, much more sophisticated tools. We'd be interested in, in talking to you about that. Um, let's see. Um, there's a question from Cody uh, Landstrom saying, fleet cards are a hot topic in the trucking space currently. Is there appetite for something similar in the charging space? Oh, and sorry, Chris. Before we go on to that, did you have anything you wanted to add on the question of measuring emissions? Yeah, uh, we actually have the the, the app I mentioned. Um, it's it's called Zootopia. Um, it, it, it's in beta right now. Um, it's a phone based app. It looks a lot like uh, Google Maps or whatever. You you can go out and take a picture of the license plate of a car, or or even better, it's uh, it's VIN sticker or or, or um, and uh, it will automatically load what type of car it is, including. Uh, whether it's a, an EV or a, or, or a, a, an ICE car, uh, from that it can get its uh, its emissions, uh, you know, it, its vehicle weight and, and its emissions. Uh, from that it can calculate, you know, the the marginal cost to include incentives, and so you can actually do it uh, again, sort of at the at the level of the vehicle. At this very micro level, you don't have to make assumptions about, you know, California vehicles in general or. Uh, or, you know, and and you know, provide the, these micro incentives um, that that I had talked about earlier for changing behavior. Got it. Um, um, there's a question. Okay, back to this fleet card question. Um, you know, fleet card is basically. I think everyone, maybe the audience, doesn't fully understand. Fleet card is basically a way you can have. Uh, uh, it's like a. It's like a purpose. It's like a account specific credit card for, uh, for someone to, to purchase gas if they're part of a fleet so that they don't have to pay for it themselves. Um, I, I don't know of a similar program for charging infrastructure. There's gotta be one. It seems like kind of an obvious thing. Um, I don't know. I actually don't know. Chris, Casey, do either of you have any insight on this one? I don't know what's out there at commercial scale. Uh, you know, one of the things that's included in our standard is is how, how you uh, get people 
to use the decentralized resource, you know, if they have a, a local charging station or a neighborhood charging station, uh, how you can use that in a, in a, in a share and charge in a decentralized system while providing information to the grid so you don't blow up the grid if you have a lot of people charging at a certain time in a certain neighborhood. Uh, so I, I, I think it's coming, but I don't know any, any scale commercial solution right now. Okay. Okay, um, well, I think we should wrap. It's now the top of the hour. Um, thank you all for those of you who stuck around. Um, 26 very dedicated, very <laughs> curious people out there. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, we'll be sending a follow-up email with, uh, with a lot of these links in it as well. And we're gonna post uh, an edited version of this video um, and we'll send out a note about that as well. Thank you all for showing up. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.